Hi, everyone. How are we doing tonight? Yay! You all are my favorite people for coming to the library on the most beautiful day of the year for such an exciting event featuring Max Strang with our, one of our favorite partners, The Glass House. Um, my name is Julia Ray Hoddenfield. I'm the manager of adult programming for New Canaan Library. And before I let Hillary Lewis begin the introduction of tonight's program, I want to be the bad cop and remind you all to turn off your cell phones and pagers. <laughs> and also, please take note of our auditorium exits. They're there. You can get right out to the parking lot very easily at the end of the program. Or if you need to grab a book at the end of the event, we will have about 20 minutes um, that the library will still be open. So that's great. Um, tonight's event uh, featuring Max Strang is going to be really exciting. Um, there's going to be about a 30 minute presentation. Um, a short discourse between Max and Hillary Lewis of the Glass House, and then we will have some time for Q&A at the end. So if you think of something really good to ask, note it down in your mind or in your notebook so that you can get a chance to have your questions answered at the close of the program. So without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to Hillary Lewis of the Glass House. Thank you very much. Thank you, Julia Ray. Oh, it is so nice to be in this gorgeous space. It's the first time for me being in this uh, wonderful, newly, uh, newly launched New Canaan Library. And thank you so much, Julia Ray, for allowing us to partner with you once again uh, uh, on a, a new series of, of programming here at, uh, for the Glass House uh, along with the New Canaan Library. I am absolutely delighted to be able to present tonight uh, this wonderful program with Max Strang. I have been a fan of Max's work for many, many years. It's hard to believe because he's, he's so young. You'll see when he comes out. But he's been working for a while doing absolutely exquisite modern architecture uh, focused on in, in the region of South Florida, but working in some other areas as well, uh, known for uh, really exploring how to make the most, uh, most exquisite modern architecture that makes sense for the 21st century and also particularly makes sense in the region that is subtropic, subtropical, uh, which is South Florida. Something that in the early days of modern architecture, there was really a sensitivity to region that you would design based on where you are. And so, of course, what we have here in Connecticut would be a little different than what you'd have in Palm Springs. And different again from what you'd have in South Florida. In some ways with technology, we got away from that. And a lot of architecture uh, took on almost kind of a uniform quality because you could always fix things with air conditioning and heating and whatnot. But there's something very special about a region having its own type of architecture, its own <coughs> idiom uh, within uh, the modern movement. And so this is something that it, we're just going to be considering tonight. In particular, uh, Max is going to be speaking about his mentor, Gene Leedy, who is an important figure uh, in launching the, um, the Sarasota School in Sarasota, Florida. Now, some of you will think of the Sarasota School as uh, where Paul Rudolph cut his teeth in architecture, which is true, but it was actually launched by Gene Leedy. So we're in for a very interesting evening tonight because we're going to be looking at the history of, uh, of modernism as seen in the region of Sarasota, as, all, as well as in other parts of Florida. Um, Gene Leedy ended up uh, in, in Winter Haven in central Florida. Uh, and then also looking at the work of Max String's extraordinary office, which has grown to, I believe, now about 50 um, uh, architects in the office, which by the standards of architecture is a pretty big office. When I first met Philip Johnson, he had about 60 people working in his office. So this is quite an accomplishment. Um, I had the honor of meeting Max String quite a number of years ago uh, in Florida, where I got to view work that he was doing uh, to create uh, really fairly low cost but exquisitely done housing for, um, uh, for, for senior housing. And this is, it's so interesting that talent like Max Strang's can be applied to that just as easily as to a $25 million home. How fortunate to be able to live in something that is so carefully considered and beautifully executed. So with that, instead of doing one of my more lengthy intros where we go through the full academic accreditation of, of, of Max Strang, I'm going to bring him right out. We'll cut to the chase. He's going to speak for about 
30 minutes um, speaking about, um, uh, uh, again, his mentor, how this has influenced his own work. And then we're going to speak for a little while, and then we will open it up to some questions and answers from you. Just to remind you that this is part of our series, Glass House Presents, uh, which, we're, again, we're honored to do in coordination with the New Canaan Library. Um, our next program will be next month on Tuesday, October 3rd, with um, artist Mark Menon, who is the artist that we have featured currently at the Glass House. So I hope uh, that some of you will rejoin us then. And if you have not yet been to the Glass House this season, we hope that you certainly will do so and get to see um, this beautiful sculpture on site. But without further ado, may I please introduce to you Mr. Max Strang. Hello, everyone. All right. Um, architecture lectures can sound kind of boring at some, on some level, but we have 150 slides to get through in about uh, 30 minutes. So the back of the napkin math is about a slide every 12 seconds. So you're in for a roller coaster. Um, how many of you guys have been to the glass house here? I'm assuming that, uh, yep, most of you have. Um, I believe when you see the, the slides and the influence of Gene Leedy, uh, you're going to see why um, we kind of tailored this lecture specifically for the Glass House. Uh, it's um, like, actually, I'm probably getting late on my slides. <laughs> As Hillary said, this story starts in Sarasota. Um, I'm not sure if I see as many hands being raised for familiarity with the Sarasota School of Architecture. Half? Okay, so in the 40s and the 50s, um, on the west coast of Florida in Sarasota, there was a lot of great experimental architecture going on. Um, Paul Rudolph was the ringleader of it, but there was uh, probably a handful, seven or eight other architects um, that were doing some really, really great work at the time. Um, the date here is 1950, so perspective-wise, Glass House was done in 1949. Yep. Okay, so it's all very contemporary about the same time. Uh, this is the uh, Cocoon House, is the nickname. It's called the Healy Guest Cottage, and it's on Siesta Key. Uh, I remember as a kid seeing that picture on the left, the black and white one, and I guess the architecture books that were laying around my house, and it's a, it was a real treat to actually go and visit it um, uh, not too long ago when we moved to Sarasota. Uh, I also put up a, a great uh, artist piece um, by John Pierman, who really likes to celebrate the mid-century modern architecture of Sarasota. It really captures the spirit of the time. And this house is the Hiss House. And again, um, 1950, it was kind of a radical house for the time. In Sarasota, they're doing mostly Mediterranean work. So, you know, to take a modern box and raise it off the ground, and then, you know, that was for trying to catch the breezes and also getting out of the way of storm surges and such. But, uh, you know, they figured, wow, you can put stuff underneath the house. You, can, you know, you have shade, you can pull go under there. So it, it really opened up some more space, um, some interesting ideas for that. Uh, right across the street is the Hiss Studio. And you're going to see the term Hiss a lot because Philip Hiss was the benefactor of the entire Sarasota School of Architecture movement. Uh, and just to clarify, there wasn't a physical school building called Sarasota School. It was a term, a term coined by Gene Leedy, um, kind of like the Chicago School or something that really was more of a, uh, it was a movement. Um, and so Phil Hiss, uh, he was a great benefactor. Uh, he, he got together um, a lot of great talent um, and really pushed commissions to these young architects that were really only in their, their 20s and 30s. Um, so there's the Hiss Studio, which was right across the street from the Hiss House that I showed you there before. Uh, and again, um, Sarasota has a pretty, uh, pretty, what was the word I'm trying to find, um, supportive uh, community for modern architecture. There's a group called Architecture Sarasota that has a, it's almost like a modernism week. It's a mod weekend where they open up a lot of these homes for tours and stuff. Next one's in November, so... Um, that's a great time to go down there. I think the most famous house that you may have heard of is the Umbrella House. Um, and again, I think this old picture here really kind of drives home the fact that, you know, we're building on sandbars there. These are barrier islands. The ground's really only three feet above sea level. 
Um, and this is pre-air condition as well. So the umbrella house, the idea came for let's have a house and put an umbrella over it to keep the, to keep the heat off. Um, this is, what's the year on that one again? I think it's 53. So again, we're still in, in the early 50s. Um, this house is, uh, was also commissioned by, by Phil Hiss. Uh, and it, this is all on uh, Lido Key, which surrounds St. Armand's, if you're familiar with, with the area. There was a lot of attention, probably primarily based on the fact that Paul Rudolph was uh, just spitting out these amazing pen and ink drawings um, of all these projects. And this was the stuff that really caught all the, um, the eyes of the, uh, of the public. And it was, I guess, Sarasota got on the international map um, because of these types of, of homes that were, again, they're very radical. I'm not sure how well it's gonna hold up in the hurricane at the time, but it was, um, um, it was at least working very well um, to enable somebody to live, you know, in the tropical heat without the air condition. One of my favorites is this one, the Walker Guest House. Uh, this is actually on Sanibel, a few islands south. It's still there. Uh, tiny little guest house, right? Um, uh, and it was celebrated widely uh, in the media at the time. Uh, Architecture Sarasota, a few years back, maybe this is seven years ago now, they built a replica of the thing, which was a great idea. And actually, it recently got auctioned. I think they rebuilt it again in Palm Springs and went, went to an auction. I'm not sure where it eventually landed. Um, but for about a year or two, they had it on the grounds of the Ringling uh, Museum there on Sarasota Bay. So it was a great, so I guess there were two at the time. The original is still in Sanibel, but, but this was the, uh, the replica. Uh, that was in the area. But to me, this little tiny house sums up a lot of the, uh, just the experimentalism, you know, with architecture. How do you build light? Um, how do you make these delicate, I mean, all these materials you could buy, you know, at a Home Depot and put them in the back of a pickup truck today. You know, they're basically two by fours uh, and very simple, very simple materials. Uh, this Paul Rudolph drawing is of the Sanderling Club in Sarasota, and uh, my wife and I, our family moved, we've jumped around a lot, but we moved to Sarasota about seven years ago, and we live in this neighborhood, and a big draw was um, these little cabanas that are right there on the water. Um, this is a picture we took just a year or so ago, so it's really great to see the whole community, there's about a hundred homes there, you know, they all gather together, uh, watch sunsets, and uh, uh, just go into the Gulf. It really is a great uh, community generator, too. You know, just, uh, uh, there's one more shot of it. But uh, I forgot to put a shot in of uh, this last hurricane about a month ago or two weeks ago, whenever that was. Uh, these things are precariously set right there on the Gulf. So unfortunately, about half of the 25 cabanas got damaged to the point where uh, you can't occupy them now. But um, again, they'll take some trucks to Home Depot, get some 2x4s, and they'll be back. The Harkavy House, uh, we're getting a little bit later into the 50s, 58. This was, an, this was another Rudolph. Um, and again, you're seeing the theme there, right, of lifting up you're not doing a lot of slab on grade here, but to me, just the uh, celebration of structure, the roof structures, um, you know, it's something that I think in the tropics work, work real well. You know, you just, you're catching the light um, and you don't see those overhangs here in the Northeast on the same kind of houses, right? So that was the regional modernism, the adaptations of that universal style and making it fit to where it is. And that's, I think that is really why Sarasota caught on so much, is because the architects did that so well. Another house, um, this one's on Casey Key, which is about five miles south of Sarasota. I grew up in the central part of the state, but my parents had a beach house that they got um, on Casey Key, and it was about three or four doors down from this house. So I have a lot of memories of just walk on the beach looking for shells and shark teeth. You can pick up shark teeth on the beach there. Um, and, you know, 
everywhere you look, there's modern architecture. Um, and so I think, and this house is still, it's still there, um, but it's, uh, it had an influence on me. Paul Rudolph eventually started getting bigger and bigger commissions. This was Sarasota High School. Um, he did two high schools in Sarasota area, actually. And this, My, this Milam house in Jacksonville, or I think Ponte Vedra, actually, uh, this was his last commission house in Florida before he uh, went up to Yale. Um, and I guess he was the dean of architecture at Yale for a while. And then, I mean, his commissions go on to you know, skyscrapers in Hong Kong, you name it. Um, the Yale Art and Architecture Building is one of the more brutal structures that he's also well known for. Uh, the, a lot of historians, architectural historians and critics, though, they point to his early work here in Sarasota as probably his best work. Um, I tend to agree, unless you're a very brutal architecture fan of brutalism, but uh, uh, to me, his, the lightness and the delicate stuff um, of his early years, I, I think, was much more, uh, well, it's much more palatable for a lot of people. So there's a spinoff here. Gene Leedy was, I believe he was the first employee um, of Paul Rudolph in the Sarasota office. However, in 1954, uh, Gene Leedy got a commission to do a house in Winter Haven, Florida. Um, this tiny little sparrow house. Uh, so I need to say Winter Haven's about an hour, hour and a half drive from Sarasota in the middle part of the state. And so, Gene got this commission, uh, did this tiny little house, and really fell in love with the area. And he had a favorite quote that he'd prefer to be the big fish in a small pond instead of a small fish, small fish in a big pond. So he eventually moved his practice to, to Winter Haven um, in the mid-50s. And Winter Haven is a, it's a tiny little town at the time. There was a lot of citrus groves and freshwater lakes. It's called the City of 100 Lakes because there's so many. I didn't count, I'm not sure if there's 100, but it's a good, it's a good name. Um, and one of the earliest projects that he got involved with was called the Craney, kind of Craney Homes. Um, and he, in 1954 or five, he started de um, designing these for a developer. They're gonna do like 100 or 200 of these homes. Um, on a hill next to a lake in Winter Haven. They ultimately ended up only doing uh, eight or ten. Um, there's an aerial shot of those. And at the time, these homes were available for $16,000, including the land. You get the house and the land for $16,000. Um, times have changed a little bit. <laughs> um, but this crany spec house, again, I don't like the name of it, Craney Spec House, but it's, it's, uh, it was um, awarded a Florida National Historic District uh, last, or maybe two years ago. So of those eight or 10 existing homes, there's still a critical mass of those there, but uh, they were testimony to that post-war architectural design, uh, trying to make homes affordable, um, practical for small families, uh, and they were so simple. Um, there's the main volume you see here. It's 1,100, I almost said 1,100 square feet AC, but they didn't have AC back then either. So there was 1,100 square feet within the glass uh, and then a little uh, detached carport. I think laundry room was out there. Um, and this, this little home got a lot of attention. Um, and this particular one uh, actually became Gene Leedy's own house that he purchase it from the developer, or maybe he got a great deal on it, and uh, uh, that became his, I guess, 1956, 57 is when, is when he moved in there. Uh, and he stayed in that house uh, uh, until his death. And part of the story of the house is just kind of how resilient it is and to additions and growing with the family, evolving with the family needs. Um, this was a view from the original street frontage. It just had a wood fence kind of separating a tiny little courtyard. It really was plopped down in the middle of a grapefruit grove. Um, I think that's mostly dirt all around the house. And maybe that's why it was $16,000. They didn't, they didn't do a lot of other yard stuff there. Um, but you'll see some other photos 
and you can detect how this house really grew over time, and not just this one particular house that was that was the Leedy residence, um, because the street had an architect living on the street. All of the other neighbors became friends. There was a saying that Drexel Avenue was not an address; it was a lifestyle, and they used to all go back and forth to each other's houses. And uh, even though you know they're very private homes from the street not like the porches and all that they they were very uh they're very social and so so the neighbors always would call gene and say hey i need to add a uh, another bedroom here or this here and you know so constantly he was tinkering and uh redesigning these homes over over five six decades I guess one day he got a very important thing in Western Union Telegram that said uh, these homes were going to be part of the, I think, uh, was it the Better Homes and Garden or some big AIA Merit Award thing. So again, these, these tiny little homes in a sleepy little part of the state started to get a lot of attention. Um, and it became one of, uh, I think, the five-star homes. Uh, it was a catalog at the time. And so I think Gene said he was paid 50 cents for every plan set they got sold for five dollars to somebody and uh, there's a lot of these apparently um, not just in Florida but all around the states and a few a few in Europe so uh, in speaking with Gene's uh, Gene's son every every few years he would learn about an, a new one that he had not even heard of before so it kind of became a, a gift that kept on giving for him uh, this interior shows the very basic um, original incarnation, I would say, of, of the interiors. It had cork floors. Uh, the ceiling that you see there, that's actually the structural slab, if you will, of the house. It's like a five inch thick tongue and groove wood plank. And so they're all, all nailed together. So the, the, um, it's not just like a veneer of wood hiding a structure above it. That, that is the roof. I get to use my pointer. Uh, so, so this was at 1,100 square feet. Oh, no. Catastrophe averted, I think. <laughs> uh, so this is at 1,100 square feet principal wing of the house. Um, and originally over here, there was just this uh, carport and laundry room. So over time, uh, Jean not only uh, added square footage, but it's these walls, these concrete block walls that really lent the homes just a large degree of permanency. And they just, uh, and beyond that, it was the way they moved from inside to out through the glass that really made these homes sing. Um, they started off with only one wall. This concrete block wall was the only wall we got for $16,000, I guess. but. Uh, um, over time, though, he enclosed the entire property with the courtyard. So he used to say that um, he wanted to walk around naked all the time and not have any neighbors look at him. So that's what you get when you get a perimeter wall like that. Uh, this is a picture probably from the 80s um, that kind of showed how, you know, he was always aspiring um, to improve the interiors through art, through furniture. Uh, it's kind of grainy here, but that's a large uh, Sid Solomon artwork for those that know the uh, abstracts. Expressionist artist Sid Solomon, he was, he was good friends. Um, he later designed a house for him. You'll see it here in a second. But, um, but as you can see, he started to get the Eames chairs and uh, uh, the look of the house, the feel of the house changed a lot. Here, this wasn't Gene's house, but it was one about two doors down. Um, as part of the craney uh, development. Uh, I find it very, or I think Gene found it very uh, flattering that for this great book called Sarasota Modern, they chose a house in Winter Haven, an hour and a half outside of Sarasota. So to me, that's testimony that um, that Sarasota School movement, that Sarasota School of Architecture vibe, you know, it's, I think Gene was one of the best, his work was one of the best represented representations of that. Um, and uh, this is a hard book to find, but if, 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 you, uh, if you see one in a bookstore, I'd get it. I've seen some for like $500 now because they're, they're out of print. 
so as Gene was designing these $16,000 homes, he was putting up his own, uh, his own shingle, if you will, in Winter Haven, and it was a uh, pre-stressed concrete shingle. And ultimately, this is what he would be known for the most, is his pioneering use of pre-stressed concrete. Uh, this was 1961. Uh, there's actually a building that is next to this that was built in 1960. Um, still trying to get the, the confirmation of this, but some say it was the first all pre-stressed concrete building um, in, in the state of Florida. And there's Gene going to work. So the interior of this office, those are sliding glass doors, by the way, too. And they really didn't have like 14-foot sliding glass doors you could buy at the time. So they were all custom fabricated. Um, and the roof that you see here, I guess there's, there's Gene at work, uh, there's pre-stressed beams at the top were called double T's. Uh, so not just pre-stressed concrete, but the double T's is really the signature, his signature move, I guess. Uh, this uh, hotshot architect moved from the big city of Sarasota to Winter Haven, and he got the commission to do City Hall. So uh, the City Hall of Winter Haven still stands there to this day. However, they are about to build a brand new city hall they've outgrown this one um and the, the hope and i believe that the support is there that this will uh, turn into a museum or an art gallery um of, of, of such uh, gene did not ignore his great friends back on the coast so that's gene and uh, paul rudolph there so they collaborated on the lake region yacht and country club in winter haven there's no yachts in winter haven by the way but <laughs> By having that in the name, the, reci the reciprocity worked well with other, other clubs. Um, so this is a great building. Unfortunately, it got torn down about 10 years ago. Um, you know, there were all of these um, other uh, hotly contested demolitions that happened, and the preservation community was up in arms, and there were petitions and stuff. And Winter Haven, this went down without a fight, they, with, without a whisper. They didn't know. Um, kind of what they had. So um, I sent some pictures of the demolition to the Paul Rudolph Institute, and it wasn't really on their radar either. So it kind of, kind of went through. So not only did Gene incorporate these concrete pre-stressed double T's for offices and the commercial work, he really found a way to make it work well on the residential scale and the residential detailing. Uh, he became best friends with the precast engineers, and they developed custom, you know, a custom system of attachments <coughs> to make it work. Uh, this, when this building was going up, the neighbors, they, they tried to get the city to stop it, and they said it looked like a sewage treatment plant. Why would they allow that? Um, but this is, uh, uh, this, is, this is also in Winter Haven, and also there's two kinds of double T, or two sizes of double T's. These are the... Uh, the 12 inch deep ones and then later on he'll get to the larger 24 inch ones. so uh, just for scale purposes um, this is kind of the evolution of he went from these little wood houses to these smaller double t's to the big double t's so the slide on the left is the rear of the house i just showed you on the on the front and it was finished in 1963 and are you familiar with the the Bunshaft residence in the Hamptons that was also finished, curiously, in 1963. Um, so the Bunshaft residence was the one that got, I think it got gifted to the Museum of Modern Art, and then they sold it to Martha Stewart. Something happened, it got torn down. Um, but the interesting thing is here, you know, here in the Hamptons and then here in Polk County, Florida, you had some similar stuff going on. Um, now, I remember Gene would always tell a story about which one came first, and I don't know the details of that, but I'm, lo I'm longing to really find out um, what happened there. I can tell you that Gene was um, 
experimenting in his own office with those double T's two or three years before this. And Bunchaft was an architect at Skidmore, Owings, and Merrill. And uh, Louise Skidmore lived in Winter Haven. So at some point, we think Gordon Bunchaft came to Winter Haven to, uh, as part of a Skidmore visit, um, met Jean. And so I'm going to put my money on Jean influence Bunchaft on, on this one. And shame on you, Martha, right, for tearing that down. So this is the commission that Gene thought he was going to get run out of town. <laughs> um, so this is the Dorman residence, and that's quite a carport, right? You saw the carport in the first little $16,000 house. This one, um, this one's bold. Uh, this is on Lake Otis, actually. So that lake in the background there, um, I think at last count, Gene had designed probably about 12 different houses on that lake. Uh, and I happened to grow up on that lake as well. So when I was out canoeing or something as a kid, just this was normal to me, seeing, seeing homes like this. And that's the rear of that house. So, you know, he, he was stretching these double T's to get the eight and 10 foot overhangs. Um, but, you know, he would say the, the clients would always get very excited because they put this skeleton up in like over a weekend, you know, it would happen fast uh, and then the clients would start to moan about how long it take the house to get actually done once the skeleton was in place but um, to me the skeletons themselves are are uh, like sculpture SA fraternity house um, that's in Gainesville Florida this is uh, I can't think of a more indestructible fraternity house <laughs> and I was friends with uh, Gene's son, Ingram, and we both went to University of Florida. Um, I did not pledge SAE. I thought it felt too much like home, but, uh, um, but, but he did. And th they would literally have hoses inside the thing. They would wash down the whole house inside out after parties. Um, so it was, it, was, it was a good fit. I mentioned the Sid Solomon connection earlier. So the artist Sid Solomon, um, you know, he uh, had a house up in New York, but also he had a winter house on Siesta Key. Uh, so this was 1970. Uh, this was, you can see the house in the lower corner here. A lot of Gene's houses had two wings. You know, it had the main wing and then the guest wing. In this case, the back wing was the art studio, which is that space there. Um, I guess there's, there's Sid there, but it was, uh, you know, Gene would say, if you get, if you built two wings, you get the space in the middle for free. That was a good way of uh, defining that space. So um, this house was, let me see, let me back up. So this house was built in 70, and around 85, uh, there was a, a channel between the Gulf of Mexico and the Intracoastal that started kind of moving outside its banks and it was threatening two or three homes n nearby this. And eventually um, the Gulf or the channel moved far enough north and the house uh, was condemned and eventually torn down. This was the last uh, spread footer house built on the island. So spread footers when you only go down two feet or so with your foundations. Um, now on all these barrier islands, you gotta go down 20 25 feet usually to build these these homes that are right on the water this was the first national bank of cape canaveral so um, again gene started to be noticed and getting other commissions larger commissions elsewhere uh, this was um you know in the atomic age too right so imagine in the 60s he was enjoying going over there seeing site visits and rockets launching um, this one is, that's, that's Sid again. This slides out of place, sorry about that. Um, but yeah, you, you can see all these balconies overlooking the Gulf of Mexico there. And you can see how far the sand, or how far the sand went at the time. But, you know, over 15 years, uh, it all eroded back. Um, jumping back to the First National Bank of Cape Canaveral, 
uh, I guess it's now a Wells Fargo. Uh, this is a team from the University of Central Florida doing some laser scans on the building, some preservation scans. So uh, a few years ago, it was at risk of being torn down. I don't think it did get torn down. It's a Wells Fargo now, actually. But the, uh, the image you see on the right, that's not a picture. That's a data, that's a cloud, what's it called? A, a point cloud um, computer imaging of the building. So um, I thought that was an interesting way to do that. So of all the commissions, one of them was the Strang Residence, which was the house that I grew up in. Um, so I was born in 1970, the year that, that, that the house was done. And uh, it was an impressive house as a little kid. <laughs> so uh, that's me inspecting the, the raking on the concrete block. But um, as, as large and imposing as the house is on its own, to be a kid, a toddler in there growing up, it was, it was enormous. Um, here you can see his double T, uh, pre-stressed uh, concrete beams, but also this does have a Spanish tile gable roof on it. So um, I'm not sure if that was my mom or my dad that pushed for that, but, um, but they won. Um, the young artist at work, but uh, from a very early age, I think that I had no choice. I was kind of destined to, to become an architect. Um, with, I was surrounded by not just this, this one house, but just everywhere I went in the community, there was, there was Jean Leedy stuff. This was the interior of, of the house. And I, this, so again, this was, uh, this was the wobbly period of modernism, I think, right? When you go into, into the mid 70s, Things, things get interesting. Um, so that was a sketch elevation of the, of, of the house. And so this house was, again, completed in 70. I was four or five at the time. What was the OPEC oil crisis years? Anybody know? 73? Yeah, so uh, apparently energy got really expensive around that time. And one of my fond memories growing up um, was my dad would always have a contest to see how long, how many months they could go in the year before turning on the air condition. Um, because that glass, it would, it, it, would it, it could get hot in there. So this is a nice pivot to, uh, what would that be, 30, 34 years later. Uh, one of the first homes that I designed was a house for for my own family uh, in Coconut Grove in Miami. And uh, it got the name The Rock House. Um, there's a lot of rock on The Rock House. Uh, but already you can see some of, the, some of the DNA of that Sarasota school coming through. Um, specifically, that Harkavy residence by Paul Rudolph, if you remember the, the eaves of that house. And you know, obviously the repetition from all of those, uh, those, those Gene Leedy experiences. Um, yeah, just so I can't talk about the Rock House without another mentor of mine, Barry Masson on the upper left. So uh, he was an old character of Coconut Grove, and he taught me about the, the limestone bedrock of Miami, which is called oolite or oolitic limestone. And um, all of Miami, like, there's a ridge that goes 18 feet high through downtown Miami um, and points south. So it's actually part of the highest parts of the southern part of the state, 18 feet high. Um, but uh, you can excavate it, and this is a load of rock being delivered for our house. Um, so I just fell in love with the, with the material itself. There's another delivery of rock to go on, to go on the house. Um, and, uh, you know, I think as far as character and sense of place, most people don't think of a lot of rock homes in Miami, but really when you're using the materials of the place, the architecture is of the place too. So we got a lucky break when Michael Mann was driving down the street one day and looked up and said, that's my drug lord house. <laughs> so he was doing a movie of Miami Vice. It was a 2006, uh, it wasn't critically acclaimed very much. Or it, it, was, it wasn't a box office success, but it was still a pretty good movie. Um, 
So through special effects in Hollywood, they transported the house to the Iwasu Falls in, in South America. <laughs> we would have people come to see our house afterwards and ask to see the waterfalls, believe it or not. <laughs> but we would, I'd say we have a pool, but um, so. Actually, my daughter's over here in the audience tonight, and not many kids can say that they got to live and grow up in a drug lord house, right? So. <laughs> Um, so I think this was that multifamily project uh, that Hillary was talking about earlier in Winter Haven. Um, you know, this is called the Rain Garden Apartments in downtown Winter Haven. It was their first downtown multifamily housing in over 20 years. But again, you can kind of see the uh, influences just from picking up seashells. Um, stayed in touch with Gene throughout the years. Uh, this is part of his Sarasota crew. Do you guys know Burt Brosmith? He used architect here, used to live in Pound Ridge, not nearby, but uh, he was also part of the Sarasota. He ran Paul's office um, for a while in Sarasota. Uh, the AIA national conventions, we would love to do tours. They call it Lady Land. Um, that's, that's Gene holding court in the middle there um, as he was getting on in the years. Uh, this was the neighbor across the street. And there's that rain garden again. Okay, so I'm gonna cruise through just some of our own work right now. Not a deep dive on any one particular project, but just so you can kind of see, again, the DNA running through this. Uh, this was a project in Key Largo. Um, and again, trying to use the local stone. It's, also, it's called Keystone uh, because it's uh, quarried in the Florida Keys. Um, I don't have a close up of it, but he's got the fossil record in the stone itself so you can see brain coral star coral sea fans it's just a, it's a it's a wonderful material um and we started to get commissions this in miami beach the bulk of our work now it seems like are uh on the islands in biscayne bay and and around miami beach so um this was a great project for a new york client again using the this is more of a rough cut of that same um that same keystone and this, this is why people will continue to move to Miami and live on the water, you know, despite all the hurricanes, despite the insurance, despite all that, um, people will con continue to do that. This is the interior of that. There's still there's some mid-century vibes in there. Um, uh, this was a project we're working on in Fort Lauderdale. Um, again, you can see it elevated, but um, cues or hints of echoes of the Hiss studio there. Uh, this is a house in Pinecrest area of Miami. Um, in the interior of this, that's a Janena Chape artist, which to me reminds me of the Sid Solomon stuff, and I, I think that's why I uh, I like her work so much. Um, this was a house in Miami Beach that was not on the water, but. Um, when it, it recently sold, and it, it, it set the record for the highest non-waterfront price per square foot. And so, And it was a spec house. So I always tell these spec developers, if you invest in good architecture, it pays dividends. Uh, this was a Miami Beach net zero house. It was one of the first, or it, it was the first uh, net zero house on Miami Beach. Coral Gables house, Fort Lauderdale. Um, here's a unique project I'm working on. That's Jack Nicholas over there in the corner, but um, working on a golf course community in Palm Beach County. Um, this is a project that we're nearing completion on in the Florida Keys. Uh, some original studies. And this is, uh, it's a very raw house, and I think that's, there's a beauty to uh, just how raw this is. Obviously, this is on the front line of Hurricane Alley, so it's elevated up quite a bit uh, using board form concrete, um, extensive broad overhangs, the louvers that you remember from the uh, Siesta Key uh, cocoon house. It's all, it, it's all in there. Finally have some curves going in our projects. Mostly things are square, but we have a few with some curves. Uh, here's kind of a treetop house in Coconut Grove. Some other work on Miami Beach. Uh, 
Miami Beach Islands. This is a rendering, but um, this is this is a house proposed for for the golf course site as well. We aren't a library, so I wanted to plug our book. <laughs> um, the firm has swelled. At one point, we were 65 people. Now we're back down to 50, so we're letting some natural attrition kick in. Um, but we don't fit in our conference room, so we kind of rent out the local movie theater next door to have our big, our big meeting. So once a quarter, we'll get together. Everybody will present projects that their team's working on, and we'll have popcorn and beer, and it's a, it's a fun time. But um, um, make no mistake, it's not me toiling alone behind a drafting board somewhere. It takes a real, a, a real team to make all these projects happen, and uh, we've got a real talented bunch there. Um, but I want to kind of come full circle back to Gene a little bit. Um, again, his family and our family have remained close friends. Um, we worked hard to get his archive um, shipped off to the University of Florida, the Smathers Architecture Library there. Um, but there was an event. This was Hurricane Irma in 2017. Um, my family evacuated Siesta Key. It was not a good place to be. So we went to Winter Haven, and the eye followed us over, over Winter Haven. Um, and after the storm passed, I immediately went over to Gene Lee's house because he rode the storm out in his house. Um, so these are some of the pictures from him riding out the storm in the house. Um, all the neighbors came out there. Every single oak tree came over, and those are big oaks. Um, he, he slept through the whole thing. <laughs> I walked in there, he's like, how you doing, little buddy? I'm like, have you, have you looked outside? <laughs> so, he, and the very next year, he, he passed away. He was, get, he was getting on, on in years. Um, and the Leedy's uh, kind of brokered a deal they thought I would be a good steward of the of the house didn't need a house there but um it seemed like it was it was the right thing to do but you know there was some you know in the in in the probably the last five or ten years of, of the house it got a, got a little tired um we inherited some good furniture there we call it chair palooza there's so many great authentic chairs um some some had to be re upholstered, but um, uh, the house itself, after all the oaks were gone, most of the walls were knocked down, we, em we embarked on a rehabilitation of the house. The hard part is he was tinkering with the house all the time. So what, what do you bring it back to? What's your, what are you trying to hit? So um, we did add a pool in the back, but for the most part, we just wanted to get things cleaned up um, and looking, looking, looking much better. Um, so here's the interiors now. Um, the feud between Gordon Bunshaft is still alive and well there. Um, so again, this shows the, the original 1,100 square foot footprint, which when I was at the glass house with Hillary and Cole today, I said, what's, what's the size of this? It was 1,800 square feet. So the entire Gene Leedy house can fit inside the glass house, which isn't that big. Um, so anyhow, this was the 1,100 feet. This, these are the later additions, right? Um, so you know, when, when uh, um, I think a big part of what we did is just wanted to really reinvent, re-envision what the, what the yard was going to be as well. Um, in, instead of all the oaks. It was going to be a long time to get those oaks that big again. You'll recognize the, the setup. The apparent, so um, I reached out to Jean's daughter, Safi, today to figure out if Jean had ever met Philip Johnson or been to the glass house, and I haven't got the answer back yet, but I can tell you that um, he was an, an idol. Um, and when... Gene designed a house for his daughter in Winter Haven. He selected all the furniture, the whole, the whole Barcelona set there to be in the house. So 
Safi gave us this Barcelona set to go back in that house because she felt like that's what her dad would want there. Um, so it's, it's good to see that in there. So our office is now using the, the house for corporate retreats and things like that. Um, we're in the position now of establishing a nonprofit so we can figure out a smart way to have, uh, you know, kind of the same stuff that you guys are trying to do here. Really great programming, um, art activations, open for tours, which is not currently. Um, uh, there was a short little 20-minute uh, film that we did during the pandemic um, of, of the house, and that premiered at Modernism Week a few years ago. But I want to return to the office now, too, because what happens to Gene's office? Went a little beyond a little neglect. So th we, we, had our, we had our job cut out for us in getting the office um, back in shape, too. Not too long after it, we got a big, I got a phone call that somebody threw a rock at the front window. Not a cheap piece of glass to fix. Next month, got a call that a U-Haul truck had run over part of the Ocala block wall. So this preservation stuff is not for the faint of heart, right? It's apparently some termite damage in the cabinetry. <laughs> um, Jean didn't really do much lawn care in the back of the house, so we need, you know, it was becoming Angor Watt in the back. But we eventually got it cleaned up as well. Um, so these are some, some pictures from the past few months. This might be a video if that plays. I'm not going to risk it. <laughs> but it pans in a beautiful way to the right. Oh. And so we had to find the black telephone and a typewriter. Um, But what a piece of sculpture, right? Um, so what are we doing with the office? We're also using the office now for a um, corporate retreat. So this is about three hour, three and a half hours from Miami, which is where our headquarters actually is. Um, but it's a great place we can meet in the middle part of the state. We have some projects there as well. Um, and so this is from a recent kind of team retreat there. But our goal was to open it up for any, anybody that wants to use the space for, um, for uses because it's fun, you know, it's fun. And it's hard to believe it's 70 years old, you know, almost 70 years old. Uh, a real fun part is still snooping through all the drawers and the flat files there because we're trying to keep all of the old tools of the trade. Um, so there's... I don't know, six or seven different drawers like this where you pull out and you see all of the pen and ink stuff and um, all that good stuff. But there was one thing left to do. <laughs> um, this is Gene's office over here. And I think I mentioned that a year before he had designed another building. And originally they were meant to be together. But at some point um, they got sold off and um, it took a turn to the right, I think, but um, now you can, whatever your politics are, you just kind of keep them a little bit at bay, right? So, so an opportunity arose to purchase this building. It went into foreclosure, and I think the universe was really trying to speak to me. So, um, so I figured out how do we Fix 2020, we, we build a wall. <laughs> so we just happen to have some extra Ocala block laying around. So our goal is to unify both of these structures for the first time in 60 years. Um, and this is a view of the Leedy office now from, from that other corner building. But uh, the goal with that new structure is we're going to keep it just an open air a folly, a pavilion. I don't know, just to ex express the structure of it. Um, there's some renderings of something like that. But uh, there we go. Um, hopefully that was uh, 
within a time frame, so for a little conversation now. Okay. I think it's absolutely fantastic to see how this incredible heritage of the Sarasota School was able to filter its way into your contemporary work. I mean, you, by, by an extraordinary history, truly grew up with this. Mm -hmm. And I find it fascinating that you uh, were able to fulfill this by becoming the architect that you are and, and building the way that you do today. But it's, it's very exciting to see, but it's also exciting to see the preservation that you're taking the time to do. We in this community understand preservation very well and know how expensive it is, how time consuming it is, and how challenging it is because economically it's not always the, the obvious choice. So uh, maybe if you could speak a little bit about this extraordinary uh, project that you're taking on to take the Jean Leedy House and turn it into something that the public would have some access to and things of that nature. And we'll maybe talk a little bit about some of the things that we've had experience with as well. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a project that we weren't seeking. It just happened. You know, you mentioned how challenging and expensive and all that stuff, but I think the answer is just how meaningful it is. Right, and that's what drives us. It's, it, it's a meaningful, worthwhile thing to do. And uh, um, if we don't keep our history connections, then, then what are we doing? Um, but as for the house and office, uh, I mentioned we're gonna create a little nonprofit to try to help with the, uh, the expensive part of things. But, um, you know, this is um, Central Florida. We talked about pricing. Oh yeah, it's a little little different per it's square foot different. than it is in. For example, the some of those Jean Lee houses, you um, you could probably buy one for two hundred thousand um, dollars. It needs some, another two hundred thousand dollars fixing it up, but at least I mean that's a tenth of what it would be up here, right? So exactly right. I'm I'm hopeful that you know we can get the right types of grant money and um, and other support just from the charitable donations or memberships yeah. to to really continue what we're setting out to do. Because there's a lot of other Jean Leedy structures there, and what has preserved them is being out of the way. Yeah. You know, people aren't tearing down houses to build a new one in Winter Haven, at least not yet, because it's off the beaten path. It, you're making such an important point that it's true in many, many places where there was enough economic activity, you lose your architectural heritage because the land becomes so expensive, you can't afford to keep it. We're lucky that we have such uh, an extraordinary, extensive fabric of modern architecture in places like Palm Springs, uh, because it was a little bit out of the way, mm -hmm. uh, even though there was some encroachment on that and some change that took place. Here in New Canaan, we have lost many of our uh, modern homes. I, I don't have the exact number in my head. I'm sure there's a few people here who could probably know it precisely, but in terms of the extant uh, uh, number of homes, it's probably no more than 70% of the original array of over 100 homes. Um, so there is uh, an extraordinary history that we want to preserve, but it's a challenge. And yeah. again, if things are owned privately, uh, how do you make that, um, uh, how do you make it make sense for people to come and appreciate it without encroaching on the privacy of people who live in these places? I think uh, places like Sarasota have taken advantage of gathering people together for just a weekend mm -hmm. or in, for Modernism Week for a week mm -hmm. plus two weekends. Um, but it's a challenge that we have here because we don't want to disturb people. But we want people to uh, appreciate this heritage. Yeah. Was there a question in there? Oh, goodness. <laughs> no, well, I don't I know. Mean, I'm sorry. I, maybe I was going on a little bit more than I should. <laughs> but in terms of uh, uh, the kinds of things that you're thinking about, I'm just curious how much appreciation is there currently in the community for this style of architecture? Is this something that in, there's... In, in Winter Haven, not much. So they don't, people just say, well, no. that's just what it looks like, that's sort of... Yeah, it was too normal for them. There's probably 40 or 50 Jean Lady houses, or sorry, Jean Lady structures yeah. still in town. And yeah. growing up there, I mean, he designed City Hall, he designed the fire station, the police station, the garden center, all the doctor's offices, the, mm -hmm. the library edition. I mean, he really did design most all of the town. And so I think because of that, it was normal for everybody and it just didn't get, it didn't stand out to, to be preserved. Yeah. So it was a huge loss when the Paul Rudolph um, oh, yes. Country Club went down without a, without a whisper. Um, but thankfully nearby we do have, in Lakeland, Florida is only 15 minutes away, 
the world's largest collection of Frank Lloyd Wright structures. There certainly is. That they're an amazing uh, yep. university. Florida Southern. Yes, and that is, uh, and uh, as I recall, when I visited, which was about eight years ago, it needed a lot of preservation. I hope that that's been able to go forward. Some of it has. Some of it still is, is lingering. Yeah. Um, and we do have a new Calatrava building uh, nearby as well. So Boy, do you have one. It was, that was built, I believe it was completed in 2014, and it is exquisite. Mm -hmm. it, that is the Florida Polytechnic, which is part of the state school system and an absolutely exquisite structure. So there's a lot to go see in Central Florida. Yeah, there's a critical mass there. There really is. I find it very interesting in looking at everything that you were presenting uh, this evening. Again, the, the, the differences yet similarities with the way mid-century modern was, uh, was, was followed and was, was pursued in a, a very different region. I mean, that use of, I'm forgetting already the name of the T's, it's the- Double T's. Double T's. Um, that, that is such a specific thing. And I remember seeing buildings like that, but not really having a term for it. Um, but realizing that there's certain areas where one element was utilized uh, and it became an obvious thing, but for the rest of us, we're like, what the heck is that? That mm -hmm. looks very, very different to our eyes. So growing up, you were used to seeing these things. This was... Yeah, but that was very specific, Gene Leedy, with the double T's. Okay. You know, I don't think any of the other Sarasota School architects really yeah. employed them much. That was his signature look um, yeah. or strategy. Um, but, you know, as a kid growing up, that's how you build houses. I thought everything, you know. Sure. Can we talk a little bit more about the Sarasota School? I mean, it's interesting, and a lot of, this, uh, of the work of Leedy that you were showing, it felt so much like some of that early work of Rudolph, again, very much part of the Sarasota School, of those extraordinary kind of double height spaces, mm -hmm. um, the doorways that then are, uh, have, have an expression that goes all the way to the ceiling and just absolutely dramatic spaces. If you can just maybe speak a little bit about some of the similarities between Leedy and Rudolph. Well, remember at the time, they, I think the modern architects working in that era, they thought they found the, the solution, you know? They, they thought they found the, the rule book for, you know, the way you're supposed to design, and that, that was it. So all those floor-to-ceiling moves you're talking about, that was, you know, that's, that's the way they did it. Um, was it also Paul, to keep things cool, Max? Was that part of all ceilings do. And remember, Paul Rudolph was from Alabama originally, and Gene Leedy was from West Virginia. Um, so, I mean, and they, you know, they grew up in the, in the deep south without air condition and that, so mm -hmm. they probably respected all these things that we take for granted now. Yeah, it's very different than here where we're much more concerned about, in, for at least for the most part, of making sure that you're warm in the winter. Yeah. So it's a very different set of conditions. I'm just checking the time to see how we're doing. I think we're, we're coming Probably just maybe just in a moment, I'll ask maybe one or two more questions, and then I think we should open it up to Q and A. Okay. But uh, I'm curious, if having sp now you're spending a little bit of time with us here in Connecticut and in in the region, and you were just at the Glass House today. How how do you respond to the modernism that you see here? I mean, the northeastern expression of of modern architecture at mid-century very much came out of the history of the Bauhaus, kind of re-expressed via Harvard, Yale, mm -hmm. Columbia, uh, here. Does it, does it have a certain appearance to you that you, you look at that and think, oh boy, that's not the way I would do it in Florida? Or there's certain elements that you look at and say, oh, I may want to use that in my next, my next I mean, design. I, uh -huh. I, I think the most obvious distinction is just the overhangs, right? Glass House has zero, right? Um, the, you know, the jealousy windows and operability of the envelope was is very important in Florida mm -hmm. um, and also just the covered outdoor spaces you know um, they're used year-round in Florida and I think that it's, it's actually a benefit to working in the tropics or subtropics is you know we have a lot of those covered outdoor spaces and it just instantaneously have a lot of depth to the architecture right so it can be a little more interesting just be, because of that but um, I think those are the obvious ones, just the overhangs, yes. covered outdoor spaces, and operability of the... And again, all comes from the idea that you're looking for ways to keep the space cooler and also be able to use the outdoors mm -hmm. because the, the conditions permit it. At a place like the Glass House, the outdoors is understood best by being inside and being able to look through that glass to experience 
experience as though you're outside, but you're not necessarily experiencing uh, what could be much chillier air. You know, I mentioned like before at the Jane Leedy house, there's there, you got one concrete block wall that went from outside to in, and that was the that was the big trick. I mean, yes, there was glass around, but I mean, seeing that material slide inside and out at the glass house, you know, you're it's a different strategy. You're the goldfish in the bowl. You know, I you mean, are. you're you you you're surrounded by the outside, so. You really, really are. And Johnson, as I, I was, we were talking about this earlier today, referred to it as a permanent camping trip. Yes. Uh, it was the idea of being outside. Glamping, I think we said. Glamping. Right? He had, he had, he had, had some, said glamping. He had, he had I'm not sure if he would go for glamping, whistles. but yeah. He would, uh, it was, what was interesting, of course, is that this was the, a weekend house, mm -hmm. at least in theory, for Johnson. At the end of his life, of course, he was spending much more time at the glass house. Just in the interest of time, I hate to say, I'm going to have to wrap it up. But Max, thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> And I, re I realized that when I introduced Max, I did leave a couple things out that uh, the AIA also gave you some awards. I noticed that you were talking about what Gene Leedy got, that both the Firm of the Year and Architect of the Year just this past year uh, in, uh, in the Miami area. So we love seeing your work, and thank you so much for allowing us to get a chance to, to visit with you and visit the work this way tonight. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.